Badu, uh, Jacqueline Carey is a New York Times best-selling author of the critically acclaimed and award-winning Cushiel's Legacy series of historical fantasy novels. Other recent novels include the Shakespearean adaptation Miranda and Caliban and the epic fantasy standalone Starless. Carey enjoys doing research on a wide variety of arcane topics and an affinity for travel has taken her from Iceland to China. She currently lives in West Michigan. On behalf of Left Bank Books, please help me welcome Jacqueline Carey. Um, I'm going to warn you, I'm spacey. <laughs> I was at Comic-Con uh, in July, and everybody's like, oh, that must be so much fun. And I'm like, well, it is, but you know, probably the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade is really fun, too, for a couple of hours. <laughs> Three days later, you're still so... <laughs> um, but anyway, I had to turn around and come back out on the road. And here I am. Um, this has been, so far, and this is really only my second stop, uh, after Comic-Con, which was a plunge into a world I'd been away from for five years, which is a longer time than I'd realized. And I just mean the general world of fantasy book fandom. Um, all of a sudden, the shelves are full of the shattered swords of mossy thrones and <laughs> frosty wings. And, um, I'm kind of like, oh, wow. And here's me. And they're all like, yeah, you're the OG. You invented romanticy. And I said, what's romanticy? Um, <laughs> The funny thing, being declared a cult fan favorite, I didn't know I was until the marketing materials showed up for Cassie's <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, oh, well, I guess that's what I am now. And I remember um, when I was young, uh, my mother had this bizarre fear that I would be abducted by a group of charismatic strangers and join a cult. Enough so that I, I spent a lot of my teens looking for that weakness inside myself that they were going to find and exploit. And finally, I think in my 20s, I'm like, Mom, do you still think I'm going to join a cult? She's like, no, honey. I think you're more likely to start one. <laughs> <laughs> um, but that is really... In, certainly not what I set out to do, but also <laughs> far from my intention. Um, when I began, there was no romanticity. There was not a lot of romance at all in fantasy. There were not a lot of women in fantasy, either writing it, and there were there were some wonderful pioneers, I did not mean to be dismissive of them. But not enough, and certainly not who were um, at the level of the heavy hitters. And um, you know, you'd have a lot of we called them toll clones. <laughs> and you know how sexy Tolkien is, right? <laughs> I mean, I think Tom Bombadil's as funky as it got. <laughs> um, other books, I remember there was one, and this was in the aughts even, uh, so it was someone who was a peer. And a couple of young women were like, oh, I just love, 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 love his work. And I said, did you notice there's only one female character? And she ended up drowned in a barrel? <laughs> and they were like, oh. Yeah, now that you mention it. <laughs> Um, but it was a real dirt, and um, I wasn't going to write romance, but I wanted to write about the human condition. And it turns out, well, romance is a massive part of that <laughs> as well. Um, 
the books that were romance that I grew up on. Uh, then Gen X got thrown some odd stuff. <laughs> Who gave us all flowers in the attic? Yeah. <laughs> yes. um, I imprinted at a young age, perhaps a somewhat healthier example, maybe, it was thorn birds. Um, and as I was explaining Cassiel's Servant with a group of young authors on a panel, uh, I'm like, yes, he's very austere, stoic, castling warrior, monk. And Oliver Blake goes, hot priest! <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, yeah, okay, Thornbirds did their thing. Right? Yeah. Hot priest. He's a hot priest. Okay. Yes. <laughs> um, I do feel a little. Did yes, yeah. just, just uh, cut uh, out the microphone? I'll see if I can get that. <laughs> okay, well, I think it's a small enough room that I'm going to try and project for now. Okay. Uh, it's a good thing it's at the early end. <laughs> the early end. I told you. Spacey. <laughs> the reverse end. The beginning. <laughs> and I will do a little bit of a reading. Um, I used to not do readings for a while. Uh, well, they're either, most of us are, either, we get a few professionals who are very good at it, and then the, and then the rest of us are just kind of, okay, and then you've got a few where it's like, you know, practice really, <laughs> there's a reason. Um, In attempting to revisit this world 22 years later, uh, it, it was not also not my intention. Oh, what is it? Ta da! Yay! Yay. Awesome. Better. Um, in fact, that's questions that people have asked over the years. Will you ever, would you ever, would you ever consider? And probably telling a story from Jocelyn's point of view or Melisande are the two, number one, most common. And I, I've always said no, because that story's been told. And those are arcs of ultimately, particularly Melisande's diminishing return. Um, and then like seven years ago, I was asked to donate something for um, an organization that I had supported in the past that raises awareness of violence against women. And I'm like, ah, I'll sign a copy of Miranda and Caliban. And she said, well, can you make something to a little personal for the fans? And I thought, well, I'll just write an Elizabethan sonnet the way you do when you're immersed in Elizabethan <laughs> research. Sure. What is it? 8, 6, 14, I, you know, I majored in this. I can do this. Uh, and I polled readers and said, who would you like a sonnet to and from? And unsurprisingly, top answer was from Jocelyn to Fedra. Yes. And so I'm like, all right, it's for charity. <laughs> and I wrote this sonnet, and it was the first time that I had put myself squarely inside this character's head. And there's a big difference writing first person and third person in that um, I think one of the things that prevents the Cushiel's legacy series overall from veering into exploitation, and you know that's a real knife edge to walk. Um, but the first person point of view makes a big difference because you cannot be a voyeur reading those books. You're in it. You're doing it. You're right there in the head with her. So this was my first time not looking at Jocelyn, but 
true to size. And I was like, whoa, yeah. <laughs> that's kind of compelling. <laughs> I'm not doing it. I'm so not doing it. Not doing it. You know how much I'm not doing it? I'm not doing it so much. I'm going to write another book with a sort of warrior monkhood. Uh, yep, totally going to do that. No, no, no. I will never write that book. So I wrote Starless, and Jocelyn's still there. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> And behold, we have Cassie's <laughs> Um I think that's probably a pretty good segue into doing a little bit of a reading. Um, let me get some water here. I feel like Marco Rubio and the stealthy Sith. <laughs> I was surprised with this uh, a new publicity team at Tor that I've been working with. They're new to me. And um, <clears throat> when we first had our organizational talk, uh, they're kind of like, okay, so social media. And I'm like, yes, social media. I'm, I'm on it. <laughs> and I said, you know, there's had a lot of people on Facebook. That number doesn't really move. I know that's not where new generational growth is likely to come. They're like, TikTok. <laughs> Does Tor have a TikTok account? They do not. <laughs> but they're urging their authors, yeah, just go up and click, tick, blow up on TikTok. It's easy. It's not easy. I even had what I thought could have been the perfect viral video. So I thought, I'll, I'll approach this with the same kind of balance that I appreciate um, when people share a little professional, a little creative, a little personal, and a little bit's just, you know, quirky, whimsical stuff, their lives. So you look for those little opportunities once you've picked up the lens. <laughs> And I was in, it's kind of a juke joint, but for jazz. And they have a Monday night open night, open mic night. And there's a little dance floor with a big sign that says, dance like no one's looking. And it's a little roadhouse, the jazz band's playing away. The drummer's a friend of mine. And here's this dude in a cowboy hat and an eye patch on the dance floor, just going at it under the sign that says, dance like no one's watching. And I got a little footage of him, and he smiled and waved, and I smiled and put it up with the one-eyed cowboy understood the assignment. <laughs> like, when will the world ever gift me anything more perfect? Exactly. I've got like seven likes. <laughs> I don't know anybody on TikTok. <laughs> I'm old. <laughs> Danny Glover on this tour in <laughs> the original Lethal Weapon. I'm too old. And I'm quite sure Danny Glover was not as old as I am now when he did that. <laughs> but I did say I would seg into a reading. Um, I just, uh, I like writing essays. This isn't one, uh, <laughs> but I did just, uh, post one on John Scalzi's whatever blog. He's got uh, one called The Big Idea. And, um, I, it was some of what I, you heard me talk about tonight, but, uh, what makes, what makes something feel at once new and like it's the thing you've been missing all along. And I think that's when something has what we come to say flippantly, you know, oh, cult status. Um, it's because it, it, it touched something that is uh, both deep, but also uniquely personal to the individual. And, um, 
you think people can look at Fuchsia's legacy and say, oh, well, it's the sex, it's the kink. It's not the sex, it's the sanctity. Mm -hmm. And it was invoking the sense of sacred. Yes. And um, when I say this is Cassiel's servant is somebody else came up with this. I wish I had not just a companion novel, it's the perfect companion novel. <laughs> <laughs> um, because Jocelyn's relationship to desire is, a, I think, not one we've seen before. And this is speaking about it a little bit in his, uh, about midway through his castling training. Age 14, I understood desire, at least a little bit. It's a misconception to believe that the Castellan Brotherhood is dedicated to repressing desire. I dare say we discussed it with more candor than one might suppose. None of us were exempt from carnal urges. Our gangly young bodies quickened with the urge toward life. Muscles and sinews strung taut, yearning to bolt after pleasure like Colts bursting from stall to paddock. In the small hours of the night, desire's deep-rooted tendrils found cracks on our resolve. I don't think there's any cadet in the long history of the Brotherhood who did not waken more than once to the damp and guilty pleasure of having spilled soup in their sleep. Sleep was one thing. Wakefulness <coughs> was another. Different mentors offered different methods for coping with the thorny issue of the desires of the flesh. Me, I built walls. In doing so, I thought about those ancient Tiberian craftsmen who built the bridge across the Lucent River. Say what one will about the Tiberian Empire, bent as it was on conquest and assimilation in the days before Blessed Eloah even walked the earth the skill of their engineers was surpassingly excellent. As a child of Shem Hazai's lineage, I could not help but admire it. They hewed and cast blocks of stone and sank pilings deep into the riverbed, laying strong pillars. Upon those pillars, they constructed arches. Weight, pressure, and precision. These elements combined to create structures capable of bearing a tremendous load and enduring for centuries. I built a temple in my mind. It was a pavilion with seven arched sides, one for each of Eloah's companions, save Cassiel, representing a primary attribute of every companion, knowledge, pride, valor, desire, growth, healing, redemption, Blessed Eloah's spirit of divine love needed no single place of worship, for it was present in every aspect of Terdange, in the soil, in the vine, in the lavender and the honeycomb, in the sun and wind and rivers and streams. And in my mind's inner eye, the temple itself was Cassiel, open to the world, yet unswayed by it, adamant and enduring, a symbol of protection and the promise of grace. It was a place in which I could stand and embody Cassiel in all of his fierce and bright burning devotion. That was the haven I built within myself, a private space where my own little spark of divine fire burned. All right, so, um, I'm going to open this up to questions and answers. Uh, I was reminded in Grand Rapids that it is very often the case that you have something you wish to say or ask, <laughs> but you will sit on it, nurturing it, until you are in front of me at that table. <laughs> and that's okay, but if anybody has a question that is more general or entertaining, Mm -hmm. I have a question. So, in writing Castle's Servant, did you have to go back to Cushiel's Dart and cross-reference a lot? 
Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, did you ever look at your wiki or anything? <laughs> you know, I have done that for things like the mottos of the houses of the night court. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm like, oh, God, I don't remember what page I put them all on. <laughs> I could pull up the document and search, or I could just go to the wiki. Yes. <laughs> um, it was a lot of cross referencing, both for the timing and the choreography. Um, also, I, I didn't diverge very much from Jocelyn's dialogue, nor, well, from the dialogue at all, except the vast tracts of intrigue about which he cares nothing. <laughs> um, but things that were pivotal that would change the meaning of the original text, there's, there's very little that I wanted to do that would alter it, as opposed to adding nuance and shading and a possible reinterpretation. Mm -hmm. um, not about the books, but in the last seven, I think, eight years, there's been an event at New Year's Eve called mm -hmm. The Longest Night. Mm -hmm. And I know you've made appearances there. Mm -hmm. I just didn't know if you would speak about maybe why that event, because I know you're fairly private and um, you keep a healthy boundary with certain aspects of the Kushio fandom. But um, I haven't had a chance to attend this event yet. I would like to. But why this event? Like, what does it represent for you? Oh, is honestly. It a, is it just a hill of fun? They invited me. <laughs> I, I mean, I, if people don't know what I'm talking about, maybe just try Yeah, it. yeah. This is uh, the Longest Night Masquerade. Uh, it's been taking place in Washington, D.C. for uh, the past few years. Um, maybe more. I, I know it was in Hershey, <laughs> Pennsylvania one year. And, um, at any rate, uh, it's a group of fans who just really love the books and they wanted to bring The Longest Night to life. <laughs> Uh, the first year was a pretty big affair. It's it's gotten smaller with attrition um, and post pandemic, but this year I was kind of um, there's a reason that I was absent uh, from the book trail basically for a few years, and um, some of it had to do with some personal issues that were ongoing and there were some health issues and the loss of my parents. I was a caregiver for them. That took up as anybody who's been through that. It's, it's an honor, a privilege and a grueling experience. All of those things are true. Um, but anyway, there is also just the factor that it, authors are kind of like kind of broke vampires <laughs> <laughs> invite us to cross your threshold and pay our airfare <laughs> we might show up <laughs> you can't rescind the invitation <laughs> but it's a really um um lovely they're warm-hearted people um i've had a great time uh I am now, for someone who is, in fact, a fairly private person in some ways, nonetheless also the author who will get naked at the spa with you, so <laughs> they all know that about me now. <laughs> I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> at the event. The event. It's <laughs> actually both aspects are a lot of fun. <laughs> I would love to see that. Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> the winter of the the pantomime, the oh my god. Oh, that's that's right. not coming. Somebody yeah. help me. Yeah. The winter queen. Um, the winter the queen. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The, the sun prince. prince. The, the sun prince. prince. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they um they do an enactment of that. The first year again it was quite elaborate and I think I cried. Oh. Um, it was very moving. Uh <laughs> and I, I hope that they're able to do it again this year and that we can bring some more people to it and that I'll be able to attend again, but I cannot answer any of those things with surety right now. Yeah, sure. mm -hmm. So 
So you mentioned that you wrote Starless in between this. Like, so while you're writing about Jocelyn, did you did you compare? Because there are similar archetypes with Kai and Jocelyn. That mm -hmm. uh, whenever you, I read an article where you had talked about that, and I was like, oh, that's. Did did you like you cross reference with Baker with Baker's books, but like thinking about drawing on the martial aspects right. of, of that, that Kai that you explored pretty strongly yeah, in yeah. Starless. Did, did you, did you, was that a resource for you? Was that something that you um, thought about? Well, in the leaning away from it was, I mean, one of my very first uh, doodles with Starless, usually I've got uh, notebooks and I'm, I'm doing research, I'm jotting down notes and weird things that make sense to nobody but me. That one, I started drawing weapons. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, all right, what are we, what are we gonna do to put a, a unique personal spin on this? What are some weapons that I haven't seen in action that seem to make sense for that setting? So the next thing I know, no, I'm not reading about the Castling Brotherhood. I'm watching videos of, uh, people who are really good at throwing bolas. Taking down a goat on the run. <laughs> so um, other than to try and ensure I wasn't treading on the same uh, training field, basically. <laughs> Any other questions? Uh, there's a question from the internet. Any news on whether Dart will be developed by stars? Um, that is, I love that people always ask me this in public places or on social media. I'm like, you haven't spoken about this. Surely you will now publicly reply to me, some rando asking you this question. It's being recorded, by the way. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you can just wink once. <laughs> no, it is not currently moving anywhere under development, and I honestly, I don't think that's going to happen. It has sold a number of times, which, you know, makes the author happy without disappointing legions of fans <laughs> in a way. So I'm always happy to be proven wrong. There have been times when I thought, eh, maybe. But um, right now, in particular, I do not think the climate is right for some uh, any adapt almost any adaptation. Short of that, helmed by somebody really visionary. Uh, like I remember watching. The Queen's Gambit yes. and the way cinematography was used to convey, you know, something like that, maybe. But nobody is currently going. I have a vision. It involves a lot of low angles, <laughs> caravaggistic light. I'm like, chiaroscuro, I'm with you. <laughs> um, right now, somebody asked me, what would you most like to see adapted? Probably, if I could have my pick, I would love an animated version of Starless done for an audience that is intended to be an adult audience that would also appeal to a younger audience. But, um, you know, I love animation as an art form, and I just think those that world, that setting would come to life so beautifully. So there you go, person on the end. <laughs> mm -hmm. Now that you've revisited one of your previous characters, have you thought about looking at any of the other series and going back in and diving in from a different angle? No. <laughs> no, I can see there are, you can make an argument for any of them. Um, However, I found myself last summer, I kind of 
after all of this and after completing Castile's servant and then learning, okay, well, you lost your spot in the queue, so that's not going to come out for a while. I'm like, I'm taking a year's sabbatical. I'm doing research and making visual art. Um, and I asked myself a question that I hadn't asked myself in a very long time. And it wasn't, what do you want to write next? It was, what do you want to read? Mm. And I'm still kind of figuring out the answer to that. <laughs> but it's definitely something I haven't written yet. Mm -hmm. uh, what, where can we go to visit Pemkowet? So I can see <laughs> Daisy and yes. <laughs> That would be Saugatuck, Michigan. <laughs> Which... Um, uh, <laughs> is also a name that all of us uh, descendants of colonists were told, yes, it means by the mouth of the river and the Potawatomi are like, we don't know where the hell you got that name. <laughs> <laughs> and it was something I looked specifically for a European adaptation that got it wrong. <laughs> and I think that was, I can't even remember, because I found, I couldn't find my source again. And I'm like, all right, at this point, well, if I can't find it again, nobody's going to be able to prove a negative. <laughs> but it was something to do with the shadow of tracks in the snow. And uh, again, an indigenous community was like, um, no, <laughs> you made that shit up. <laughs> But yes, it is a very quirky small town, which has many of the aspects that seem unlikely. Maybe not the actual winged fairies, but certainly some of the human characters. <laughs> I'm just saying, I'm one of the more normal people there. <laughs> uh, in the back. Um, yeah. In uh, in Moiran's trilogy, did Prince Thierry ever have a royal companion? Did who? Prince Thierry. Oh. Like his, they um, had the royal companion for Moiran's father, but then he never had one. I don't think so. That's a little deep in the weeds for me to remember off the top of my head. <laughs> Understandable. <laughs> But no, I don't think he did. Mm -hmm. You mentioned shifting into Jocelyn's headspace was kind of a weird paradigm shift for you. When you transitioned from like the first trilogy about Fedra to being like an Imriel's eyes for the second trilogy, was that like what what was that like? Because I, I feel like that's a really weird dynamic to jump to. Considering <laughs> yeah, that was too. actually probably harder in terms of creative and psychological whiplash. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, um, both to jump into writing a male character from the first person point of view for the first time. And one with such a fraught dynamic. Um, I would say that was more challenging in some ways. Um, I also benefited though, uh, during my struggling writer years, I worked for a small um, local college and kind of ran their art department office. And I worked closely in the gallery program with a lot of young men throughout the late nineties and early aughts who were kind of wrestling with a lot of the issues that Imriel is. Mm -hmm. You know, how do I be a good man uh, in this society? How do I be a good person with bad urges? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that was definitely <laughs> now that I'm thinking about it. Yeah. Probably the hardest place I've ever gone in a character's head, though, was Darshanka. Mm -hmm. yeah. I can tell when people, all you have to do is say that word. <laughs> I've read Shale's avatar. Like, 
<laughs> you had a, a question before. Uh, yeah, I, I, uh, we, we were talking about uh, cinema and poetry a little bit, and I just wanted to ask, uh, what, what are you watching or reading that inspires you? Um, I'm doing a lot of reading right now. This is actually, I think, the last event I have before I have paired with other authors. So I'm doing a lot of get familiar with their work reading, which is always an adventure. Um, however, I just started um, She Who Became the Sun by Shelley Parker Chan, who I will be in conversation with in Chicago. Oh, and it's really good. <laughs> yes. um, the book that inspired me the most recently is a nonfiction book called An Immense World. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you guys have that here. Um, Ed Young, scientist looking at animal perceptions and how, well, animals, insects, living microbes, things, how they vary and, you know, the most basic be a range of colors we can't see, but it just, you know, electromagnetism, any sense you can think of, and seven or eight that you didn't know existed. I have been going around going, do you know mosquitoes taste with their feet? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm reading a um, I loved Wednesday. I thought the oh, yeah. was great. <laughs> so good. Yeah. There, there is an older um, uh, series of videos on YouTube called Adult Wednesday Adams. That is, it's totally independently produced, but it's also very good. Mm -hmm. I'll have to check those out. Mm -hmm. um, I guess a quick question away, but a little bit of warm up. The question really is how you feel about the title or the label "Romanticy." Um, but the, maybe the, the larger form question of that is: you start looking at specific genres, right? It, a lot of them really kind of blend together to be very similar. Take like a romance novel and like a little more western. The major difference is like what's the promise for future mass murderers? Is there going to be any? A little bit or none? Or what's the limit there? So it's there's a sort of core kind of in a lot of times, male centered view of a genre, like how things unfold. I wonder how you feel whether how your work sits in relationship to those things, those kinds of hallmarks of the other genres that you theoretically are a, a member of. Right? I am not entirely sure I understood the question. How do you feel They're about the title? How do you feel about the label? Romantic? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, I think it's a marketing label that can get my work into a lot of the right hands, I think it misses a whole other section of readers. I had an editor who I swear has been convinced from the get-go, despite the fact that we went out with a big old Robert Jordan quote on the book, <laughs> that my readership is exclusively female. Um, so I, I, I have known men who with Tom Clancy dust jackets on men's books <laughs> so they can read them in the subway. <laughs> and I'm fine with that. Uh, I, I personally, there's a really beautiful preface that John Steinbeck wrote um, to East of Eden, and I wish I had it memorized. Um, but it's about how one day he was just sitting there whittling, and a friend came along and said, Hey, why don't you make me something? And he said, well, what do you want? I said, I don't know, a box. I said, what are you going to do with a box? Put stuff in it. <laughs> so John Steinbeck went away and he wrote East of Eden. He came back and said, here's my box. And everything I have and everything I know of human nature, what is I can't remember, it's beautiful, what is good and true and vile and 
deceitful and compassionate and revelatory. It's a beautiful preface. Here's my box. I give it to you. And that's kind of the way I feel about my writing. Um, if romanticy is the label that finds the broadest swath of readers, then I am all for it. Uh, we may have misstepped a little when Tor decided we're going to jump on that whole Fifty Shades of Grey. Because <laughs> oh, yeah. I have a feeling that people are like, there's a lot of plot here. <laughs> I mean, a lot of plot. <laughs> and there's Jocelyn. This is a lot of plot. <laughs> I'm here to tell you the truth. I just learned what couture meant. <laughs> <laughs> we played a game at home. Does Jocelyn give a damn? <laughs> <laughs> Poetry, yes. <clears throat> I want to make sure I'm not, okay, since I'm asking the same question. So a follow-up question to that is the label has been given to you, romanticy, but I'm often curious what you think of each of the trilogies, like what would be a just a one word association. Like just as an example, I think of Imriel's story. I often think of it as very sad just because I can't get through the, like the second book is just full of so much intensity of feeling and sadness, even though the third book is uh, becomes very joyful and, and the first is, is hard too. Um, but is, do you have associations with, with the series? Because this is a Castle Servant is a very different world than Cushiel Start, even though it's the same thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's funny. I'm uh, and I'm surprised by the number of reviews that find it a a gentler world because we're just being raised to kill people, not <laughs> sleep with them. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I do think they are different in character. Um, I mean, it's harder to get more epic than the first trilogy. <laughs> so I really didn't try in a sense. Um, I actually, I love Kushiel's Mercy because at that point I was like, well, what tropes have I not used? <laughs> I'm going to double down on them. <laughs> amnesia? Double amnesia. <laughs> I'm going to take two characters who fell in love and have them fall in love all over <laughs> And then, um, Warren's a character who, I feel like her time is kind of more now. Uh, I, her purpose is she's a touchstone for the sacred places of the earth. That's why I, the, the mowing down Earth's oldest children. And I didn't give her direct agency so that it's like, well, what these people really need is a Pictish girl. Mm -hmm. um, but more of a conduit uh, to preserve that which is sacred. And at the same time, they're also, I would say, rollicking in a way yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that nobody ever accused either Fedra or Emerald's journey of being a rollicking good time. <laughs> <laughs> Whereas with this, we yeah. you know, the Black River of carnivorous ants. <laughs> but also some cool, fun research. Mm -hmm. I was um, really delighted to know that the Incan Empire had a system of um, food distribution so sophisticated that it was designed so that people should never go hungry. Mm -hmm. I was like, huh, good idea. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna try that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Any other questions or do we wanna? Um, OK, 
I'll go backwards, starting here. Um, I read something that you said that if that a reader entering the world through Cusiel's Cassiel's servant would have a very different experience than someone who enters your universe through Cusiel's dark. If someone hasn't read them yet, <laughs> which one would you recommend they start with? So would you recommend starting with Cushiel Dart and reading through since this is technically number four? Or I 100 percent <laughs> say start with Cassiel. Okay. I do it's um these books have been out for 22 years. If you haven't read Cushiel Dart yet, <laughs> maybe this is what you were waiting for. <laughs> And it has like <laughs> literally 90% less intrigue. Um, couture. <laughs> so you won't have to worry about rick rack and notions and such. <laughs> but it's funny that there has been such a, it's the fourth book, I'm like 10. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, yes. yeah. yeah, that's as I said the other night. Sometimes when an author and a publisher just don't see eye to eye on a thing, it's 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 all right if they spend a little time apart. Sometimes <laughs> they find out that they missed each other and then they get back together, <laughs> and everybody's happy. Um, I completely forget where I was going <laughs> with that. Oh, Cassiel as an entry. It's so much more accessible. It just is. And I I did want this once you're like, all right, well, it's coming. I'm writing it. <laughs> you know, it's like a baby. We're having this thing one way or another. It's too late to change your mind. Um, I, I thought this can serve as a really beautiful entry point. And then if somebody reads it and it's like, so all those assignations that he accompanies her to that stuff, there's a whole other, and you're like, oh yes, my sweet summer child. <laughs> yes, there's a whole other. <laughs> Okay, you had a question. So we talked a little bit about the romanticy, but the thing that, like the history, like you, you touched on the, the Inca uh, Empire and just your your depth of knowledge that you have for, and the research that you've done as far as the history in it. Do you, do you think that you, these books in particular, that people should take notice of, hey, that if you like history for like world building and those types of things, Hey, th th we ha this offers that in such a way that yeah, that really needs to be paid attention to. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, that's the problem when you're not John Steinbeck, but you've written something that you've put a lot into that box. <laughs> and then from a marketing standpoint, publishers have to decide, all right, here's who our readership is what aspect of this book can we go with? Um, an author who, actually the author I most often recommend to fans of my work is Guy Gabriel Kay. Um, and he is known for writing alternate historical fantasy. I am not known for it, but I do it. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I love it when people who do have the background to appreciate that. And I, I think of, of these sorts of things sometimes as signposts in the mist where, you know, you might be reading along and go, wait a minute, you didn't, she didn't make that up. That's, that's real. Yeah. And then sometimes I'll have people tell me things like, did you know that Venice actually was called the Serene Republic? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> Do blank to reset. 
Try to cook her walker. Yeah, I've got a few of them. Um, it was cooking for a long time. And I, um, I do still love to cook. I'm getting back to it. But during the period of time when I wasn't able to, um, my relationship with it changed a little. Um, and visual arts has been a good one for me. Getting in nature, going for a walk, gardening. Um, I do, my photography involves a lot of found and foraged natural materials. Um, I, the very first book tour I ever did was with two Australian authors who tour had brought over. Uh, Sarah Douglas was one of them, oh, and Julia Morellier. It was awesome. <laughs> Super hot. And Sarah was like, Babs, with any kind of writer's block, Babs, 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 <laughs> <laughs> and, and you know, I realized afterward, I laughed at it, but I'm like, how often do you think of really good ideas in the shower? Mm-hmm. Yeah, anything that, for me, that I think for a lot of people can engage just enough of your brain to let the daydreamy part. So, you know, you may be discovered standing, trowel in hand, going. <laughs> <laughs> I have a really good idea. <laughs> That's what the ants keep. Yeah. <laughs> that actually, I do know where the ants came from, and that is a rarity. There is a story called Leinigan versus the Ants. Um, it's an old piece of pulp fiction that is, I'm sure, god awfully racist as hell. Um, but it involved a band fighting against army ants, and that description stuck with me. <laughs> so obviously, we know where Jocelyn came from, we know where Emeril came from. Where did Phaedra come from? You tell me. <laughs> I don't. I um. I will often say that there is a part of writing that is a mystery with a capital M, and I am very much a researcher and a plotter. But even for me, there's a part where I don't know. <laughs> and from the very first sort of spark of in inkling of inspiration, that was her nature. And I was like, whoa, okay, you know, I have to decide, can I write this? Should I write this? Is it worth doing? Can it be done well? Can it be done well by me? But where she came from, couldn't tell you. Do you have a visitor? Mm -hmm. I have a very wonderful cat. At home, who I miss very much. So it's nice to have a visit. What's our name? Lucifer Morningstar <laughs> <laughs> showed up on our doorstep, black kitten in the dead of summer. <laughs> we live in the woods, <laughs> but people have dropped animals. Oh, yeah. So he opened the door, he walked in, and I, who had been the person who had forever said, no more cats, to his limit, to his limit. We had two at that time, senior cats. I picked up this kitten, and I'm like, no. Like, I'm ready to go to the mat for him. I want to keep him. <laughs> and I've never actually had a cat of my own. It's very different. Yeah. He found you. Yeah. The cat distribution system. Yeah. <laughs> the cat distribution system is working. <laughs> um, what are we at time wise here? We... Um, it's five to eight. Sign some books. Is that good? All right. Okay. Thank Let's you. Do it. All right. Thank you guys all so much for coming. Um, because I am at the start of a long one, um, I am happy to personalize any one book of your choosing and sign all the rest, but choose the one that you want the personal dedication. Okay.
And if you want a photo, it's not weird, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay.